In this lecture, we're going to revisit directional derivatives of a scalar valued function of multiple inputs. So first, let's remind ourselves what a directional derivative is. If we have a function, say, from r2 to r, and we're at the point a in its domain, we might wonder, how does my function change if I walk east? That's the x partial derivative. How does it change if I walk north? But we also might say, how does it change if I walk at an angle, or in this direction, or that direction? What is the rate of change of my function if I go in some direction, which we indicate with a unit vector v hat? During our previous discussion of directional derivatives, we needed to use the limit of a difference quotient in order to compute the rate of change of f at the point a in the direction of the unit vector v. But here's a theorem which is going to make the calculation a lot simpler. And the theorem is, if f is differentiable at some point in its domain, in other words, f has a good tangent plane approximation, then the directional derivative of f at that point a in the direction indicated by v can be computed in a sort of shortcut method by computing the gradient of f at a and dotting that with the vector v. And of course, with directional derivatives, we're always careful that the vector we're using to indicate the sense of direction is a unit length vector. We're not going to prove this formula, but we can check two famous directional derivatives. So let's check the directional derivative of f at a in the direction indicated by the i vector. That would be the gradient of f at a dot i but i is the vector 1, 0. So that's just going to return the x partial derivative as expected. Similarly, the directional derivative of f at a in the direction of j is the gradient of f dotted with the j vector, but that's going to extract the y partial derivative. And likewise for k if we were working with a function of three variables. For a different sort of example, let's find the directional derivative of f of x and y equals x squared y plus y squared at the point 2, 1 in the direction of 3, 1. So here 2, 1 is playing the role of a, and 3, 1 is not v, but we'll take that vector and divide it by its own magnitude in order to compute the appropriate unit length vector v. So v will be 3 divided by the square root of 10, 1 divided by the square root of 10. Okay, we need v. We also need the gradient of f at this point. So let me compute the gradient in general, and then we'll plug the point in. So the gradient of f in general is 2xy, and then x squared plus 2y. So that tells me that the gradient at the point 2, 1 is going to be 2 times 2 times 1, so that's 4, and then 2 squared plus 2 is 6. So the directional derivative of f at 2, 1 in the direction of v is going to be 4, 6, dot 3 over the square root of 10, 1 over the square root of 10. So that's 12 plus 6 divided by the square root of 10 is 18 over the square root of 10. This theorem gives us a lot. One thing it gives us is a fast way to compute directional derivatives that don't involve taking limits of difference quotients. But we get more out of this, because we're saying that a directional derivative for a nice differentiable function can be computed with a dot product, which means that what we know about the dot product can give us information about the directional derivative. In particular, if I come back to my picture on the top left and imagine that at the point I've highlighted, the gradient vector looks like this, so that the smaller of the two angles opened between f and the gradient is called theta, then this directional derivative can be computed as the length of the gradient at a times the length of v times cosine of that angle theta. But something I wrote here is really unnecessary, and that's because v is a unit vector. So I can rewrite this as the length of the gradient times cosine of theta. We're going to take this further on the next slide, but let me go ahead and mention that the values of cosine are bounded between negative 1 and 1, and that's going to be really key. So in particular, 
values of the directional derivative are going to be between negative 1 times the length of the gradient and 1 times the length of the gradient. So that's the first of four statements that we're going to make given this new expression for the directional derivative. For a nice differentiable function, the directional derivative of f at a in any direction we choose is going to produce a value between negative the length of its gradient and the length of its gradient. Notice the left-hand side and the right-hand side have nothing to do with the direction v, only the middle term does. If someone gives you a scalar-valued function of multiple variables, you can go ahead and compute those gradient quantities without any knowledge of directional derivatives. So what we're saying here is imagine you're at the point A in the domain. Is there some direction you can walk that would cause an arbitrarily large increase in your function or a huge decrease in your function? And the answer is no, not for a differentiable function. For a differentiable function, the rate of change of our function in any direction is a bounded quantity. One part B here is that if the gradient is zero, all directional derivatives are zero. That feels like it should be a statement in its own right. But now that we've said what would happen if your gradient was zero, all directional derivatives would be zero. For statements two through four, we'll assume that the gradient is not zero. In that case, what is the largest directional derivative that we could possibly have at the point A? And the answer is it's the length of the gradient, some positive number since we're assuming the gradient's not the zero vector. And when would we get that directional derivative? What direction would I have to walk? And the answer is you would walk parallel to the gradient so that cosine of theta was one, in other words, theta was zero. So if you walk in the direction indicated by the gradient vector, that will give you the greatest increase in your function from the point A. The minimum directional derivative is negative the length of the gradient. And that occurs when cosine of theta is negative one. In other words, theta is pi. So that means that our vector V should be chosen to be negative the gradient divided by the gradient's length. In other words, we're gonna walk do opposite of the gradient vector. So option two again is like theta equals zero, so that cosine theta is one. Option three happens when theta equals pi, so that cosine theta is negative one. And then you would have a directional derivative of zero, so your function would seem locally flat if you were to walk in a direction perpendicular to the gradient. So that would be like theta is pi over two so that cosine of theta is zero. So those are some special cases that we would get for directional derivatives. One of the major consequences, the statement I want to highlight the most is number two, which tells us that the gradient points in the direction of greatest increase from A. And not to play favorites, let me also just restate number three, which is that negative the gradient points in the direction of greatest decrease from A. Okay, so suppose that this is the domain of a function from R2 to R. And what I'm sketched here in the domain is level sets. So all points on this kind of interior curve here would get mapped to the same elevation. And in fact, what the color coding is doing here in MATLAB is this is getting mapped to a high point. So this is increasing elevation. This is decreasing elevation. So if you were a hiker, you would realize that this is where the mountain is going up. This is like the summit of the mountain. And then down here are two valleys. Okay, so what I did in MATLAB is I took a point here, and I said to MATLAB, compute the gradient of this function at this point and take a tiny step forwards. So this is a numerically generated curve. And I took a tiny step forwards, and then I said to MATLAB, okay, stop. Recompute the gradient, take a tiny step forwards. So I discretized and all along this curve, I took a tiny step in the direction of the gradient. So I kept recomputing what the gradient was and taking a little step. Not hard to do this in MATLAB. And what we have here is a curve, which if you look how this curve compares to the level sets, you realize this curve, which is following how the gradient kind of changes as we move forwards, 
is perpendicular to all of these level curves that it's encountering. Now, what is this curve going to do if we follow it? So you can see this curve starts at this low point, but the gradient always points us in the direction of the steepest increase at that point. So by following this curve, we generate a very steep path from this valley up to the peak of this mountain.